You can see many of the features of American political life that I think uh, some conservatives uh, attribute to Hegel and to uh, the invasion of uh, European thought into American liberalism. And I think that they put too much emphasis upon those um, abstract theories, which is not surprising because most of these people are theorists, um, and uh, that there are simpler explanations, and I think generally simpler explanations tend to be more convincing. Hello, everybody who's tuned in. This is Glenn Lowry uh, at The Glenn Show, uh, sponsored by the Manhattan Institute, where I'm John Paulson, senior fellow, every other week with John McWhorter here uh, at The Glenn Show, and every other week with a distinguished guest. This week, our distinguished guest is Professor Shep Melnick. He is the Thomas P. O'Neill Jr. Professor of Politics at Boston College and co-director of Harvard's uh, Program on Constitutional Government. Um, and an author of uh, several important books about the administrative, the politics of the administrative state, uh, the transformation of Title IX that was five years ago or so, uh, and most recently published earlier this year, The Crucible of Desegregation. Um, and so I was looking forward to talking with Shep about the politics of the civil rights state uh, in our time, amongst other things. I mean, there is an election coming. Uh, the president is in the dock in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, people wonder what the future of the republic might be. Uh, the Supreme Court is handing down landmark decisions left and right. So there's enough on our agenda. Welcome, Chef. Well, it's great to be here. This is a, a great show. You do a great service. Thank you. How's my friend Harvey Mansfield, your co-director on Harvard's program on constitutional government, doing? He is doing amazingly well in his early 90s. Uh, so yeah. Plus, co-taught a course with him, his last course at Harvard last spring, and it was a real delight. He is as vital and as perceptive as ever. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and his lovely wife, Anna. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, a shout out to them should they be listening in. But in any case, uh, I understand that the Biden administration has issued a sweeping executive order charging various administrative units within the federal government to take aggressive DEI type uh, actions in the management of their respective portfolios. What do you think of that? Um, uh, it's not surprising. The, uh, administ the administration uh, has been very out in front of issues like Title IX and affirmative action. Um, we have yet to see what really what they're going to, effect they're going to have on things involving affirmative action in college ad admission. I will say that I expected much more aggressive action on Title IX than we've seen so far. Uh, President Biden was very much involved in the issue during the Obama administration, played a big role in Title IX sexual harassment regulations. Uh, they proposed major changes to overturn Trump-era regulations, but they have never finalized them. And on some issues, I think that they have pulled back a bit. On transgender issues in sports, they were much more moderate than I expected them to be. Uh -huh. and, and on school discipline issues involving race, um, they have pulled back a bit too. They've been less expansive, less aggressive in uh, advocating transgender rights than you might have expected, given the overall ideology of the administration. Right. Um, and I think it's hard to know exactly what that is, obviously, because the Department of Education is notably lacking in transparency when it comes to rulemaking. Um, I think that probably the White House and OMB said, dial back a bit on this. Um, you're likely to lose in court, and uh, it's likely to hurt us in the election. Uh, but I think that was also true, not just of transgender issues, but the uh, recent guidelines they came out with on um, uh, disparate impact in discipline in K through 12 schools um, was surprisingly moderate um, in its guides to schools. Now, I'm interested in that, the discipline question, uh, because I have a essay where I 
drew a contrast between the Obama and the Trump administrations, you know, dear colleague letters out to the districts telling them if you don't get your numbers in line, you might have a you might have a civil rights problem and thinking, well, gosh, a disparity by race and the incidence of discipline could well be an indicator of differences in behavior by race in the kids that would warrant attention on its own grounds. To assimilate that to a civil rights claim might be uh, peremptory, and it, it might be exactly the wrong thing to do. Uh, and uh, I'm interested to hear that uh, uh, the Biden administration, if I understand you, hasn't swung back quite as far as Obama had been, as the Obama Department of Education had been um, eight years earlier. That, that's right. I mean, the Obama regulations, um, they were, of course, they weren't really regulations. It was a dear colleague letter. Um, uh, what one of the amazing things about that uh, dear colleague letter is that it completely ignored the question of whether there is any behavioral differences between um, uh, one racial group and another. And if you said, well, isn't there likely to be a behavioral difference if there's a difference in the proportion of families that are without um, a, a father in the family? Um, and they say, obviously, it's quite likely that is a difference, but they ignored that question. Um, the, the Biden administration didn't even issue a set of guidelines. They just issued a document that said, here are some examples of where there might be racial discrimination and what you should do about it. Um, and they really didn't deal with any of the hard cases. Um, they, they were really pulled back a lot from saying, if there's a dis if, uh, disparate impact, um, there's a civil rights violation. And you might wonder why that is. Partly, I think, is because the, the increase in violence in schools, in disorder in schools, that teachers are very concerned about this. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. a major reason why. Have you seen, just by the way, uh, Heather McDonald's uh, win race trumps merit? I, I've read a lot of things by Heather McDonald. I'm not sure I've read that particular piece. So this is a new book of hers. Uh, maybe it's uh, 18 months old or so, in which she basically argues that uh, disparate impact mm -hmm. is the bugaboo here. The idea that if I see a disparity, I, that is, as a regulator, presume it's evidence of different treatment and make it into a case. Mm -hmm. And she says this is a case in law enforcement. This is the case in higher education admissions. So I'm getting rid of the SAT. Uh, this is the case in the arts. This is Heather. She's got a book. You know, she's a conservative critic of uh, DEI type stuff. So no surprise that, but it's a very uh, forcefully argued position at the center of which is this concern about disparate impact thinking. I see a racial disparity. Therefore, it must be that the sixth situation warrants civil rights remedy. And um, I was wondering what you think about that. You know, I, I certainly have seen how that can be used in a really blunt and unfortunate way. I've got to say that part of the argument about disparate impact, I find useful. So if you see um, in employment or in uh, school discipline or in admissions, there's a big racial difference, then I think that Office of Civil Rights or the institution should say, what is the cause of this? Um, but then you should be willing to go through all of the possible causes in addition to racial discrimination. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so as a basically a starting point, I, I don't see any problem with that. It just has to be done in a much more thoughtful manner to say that there might be differences um, in family structure, there might be differences in uh, in culture, there might be differences that explain it, rather than just saying it's discrimination. Okay, so the disparity could trigger an inquiry, but the inquiry should be open. Right, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. So I, and actually, the, that's in some ways related to one of the issues I talked about in the desegregation book, that... Um, in the early days of desegregation, we went from an understanding of colorblindness, that you don't use racial uh, uh, categories for assigning kids to school. And then in the late 1960s in desegregating the South, 
we began to use racial classifications to assign kids to school. Um, now, you could say that's, that, was a very, that was the beginning of the um, end of color blindness. I would actually say that was absolutely necessary because there is so much um, use of discretion by Southern officials to avoid Brown versus Board of Education, keep the schools segregated. Now, I don't think if we use those kind of assigning kids to school by race, by the numbers, if we didn't do that, I'm not sure Southern schools ever would have been desegregated. It was an emergency. There was the racial caste system. We had to get, we had to destroy it. Um, but then you have to think, what are the circumstances in which you take the extraordinary measure of losing racial classifications? And what are the limits on that? Okay. Now that's a case, uh, Southern desegregation post the uh, Brown uh, the 50s and 60s, uh, massive resistance. How do you break it down? It's a case, but it seems to me, I wonder what you think. It may exemplify a more general principle. And, and the principle is that color, color blindness as a moral principle, as a moral uh, mandate, is not self-enforcing. That, that, that is, the idea that people should be treated fairly and equally without regard to their race, if people who are on the ground in local situations don't abide by it, can't be actually discerned and remedied unless one takes race into account. So a universal colorblindness doesn't have any teeth. Something like that. Right. No, I think that's, that's exactly right. Um, that especially, I mean, there's always a tendency when you're um, to, and, and we see this with affirmative action, um, to try to retreat into a great deal of discretion. Um, and then um, that can be used in, to inject race in either legitimate or illegitimate ways. Um, and that's extremely hard to, uh, to police. Um, and that's one reason why we end up coming back to some form of disparate impact analysis uh, to make sure that there is not, uh, see if we can figure out if there has been some uh, illicit use of race in these discretionary determinations. Do you think Justice Roberts, in his opinion, in the Students for Fair Admissions case, I mean, he, he's been uh, criticized from the left, he's been uh, lauded from the right, but a lot of people have observed, well, there's a, 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 a massive uh, uh, a hole in, in his uh, prohibition on the use of race in college admissions where he says, if race were part of a narrative in which a student was giving an account of their hardship, race figured in that particular account in a concrete and explicit and uh, definite way, it's okay to make reference to it, even though I wouldn't want you to use it in a generic way. Uh, is, that get, is that a get out of jail free card <laughs> or, or, or what? Um, I, I think it very well might be um, because we know that if admissions offices and highly selective schools are really committed to what they call diversity, what we would call racial preferences. But on the other hand, you know, I got to say, I have a great deal of sympathy for what Justice Roberts says there. Um, do we think that race should never be taken into account in any no. way? I think no, we that, don't. that we don't. You know, I mean, I, I'll just say when I have um, a, a black student in my class that I think is know, really promising, and I've had but a few lately, do I take special care in trying to mentor that student? You bet I do. Um, and I, and I'm, uh, I'm proud of that, and I think it pays off. What's the crucible of desegregation? Um, well, I use that term because um, it signifies a, a, a situation with enormous heat um, and um, that you're forming something that did not exist before. Um, and I say out of the crucible of desegregation came many aspects of what I call the, the modern civil rights state. Uh, and I try to trace what some of those elements were. So for example, um, uh, this, this civil rights structural injunction was created with desegregation. Um, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Shep. I don't know what that is. Okay. Structural injunction. The structural injunction, a uh, a legal order um, that's very detailed, 
um, that exist for years and even decades um, is changed over time. Um, and it really has been used to remake institutions for schools, then uh, mental hospitals, and then schools for the developmentally um, dis uh, disabled and prisons. And this was basically unknown before a school desegregation case. Uh -huh. An enormous expansion of the power of, of courts, mainly district courts, to remake government institutions in a way that is virtually unsupervised by the Supreme Court. So they end up, for example, with a master appointed by the court overseeing the assignment of students to schools in, I don't know, the city of Boston where busing is an issue, something like that. Mm -hmm. And many of those uh, desegregation orders that came down in the 60s and 70s are still in effect. Um, and, they, and they are revised over time. Uh, and uh, they, um, they play, as you pointed out, they appoint special masters and committees to oversee them. Often the judge will lose the interest. Um, and these new groups will be able to uh, have a great deal to say over what happens within those schools or those prisons or those um, state hospitals. And they're not politically accountable. Right, exactly. Because the, the idea was that the political system was um, either corrupt or so discriminatory that it could not be trusted. And you know, if you're Judge Garrity in, in the 1970s and you're looking at the Boston School Committee, you'd say, I don't trust those people. Not without reason. Right. <laughs> I suppose that the consent decrees uh, visited upon local police departments uh, by the Department of Justice would fit within that same framework. Exactly. I mean, one of the features, so we, we created these structural injunctions. Um, and then a variation on that was the consent decree, which was usually negotiated by the Department of Justice. Um, that does the same thing. It's legally binding um, and allows the Department of Justice to have supervisory powers um, over a police department or jail or a prison or whatever. Okay, I'm a neophyte here in terms of the legal history of desegregation efforts, but uh, fill in the blank or tell me where I'm wrong in this crude account, which is there was Brown, there was resistance to Brown, there was effort to overcome resistance to Brown. There was the blatant segregation in the South, and there was the de facto segregation in the North, and the uh, arc of history moved in the direction from the former to the latter yeah. in the fullness of time. Uh, various fights were had at the Supreme Court and elsewhere about this. Mm -hmm. uh, the net effect, however, has been that resegregation has exerted its, its, it has raised its ugly head through the de facto consequence of people living in neighborhoods and sorting themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at uh, the kind of statistics that uh, uh, empirical, empirical social scientists might gather in terms of how much segregate, you know, what's the average percentage black in a school going that a black kid is going to is something like that. Those numbers are still higher than anybody would like to see, but it's not clear what to do about it. <laughs> Have I got it more or less right? Uh, there's a lot to that. Uh, maybe I'll add a few little pieces. Please here. do, please do. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, the first thing I would say is that um, when you went from massive uh, resistance in the 1950s to um, the beginning of change in the late 1960s, one of the changes there was that um, Southern school systems changed their, their tactics. Um, they said, we're not, you know, sure, we're in favor of desegregation, but we're going to do it through freedom of choice plans. Um, and um, sometimes though those plans were uh, so manipulated, there was really no choice at all. But other times there was real freedom of choice. But for a number of reasons, many black parents were not willing to send their kids to white schools. They feared retaliation. Um, they feared that they were, that their students would be, the children would be harassed. Um, they had very good reason for this. Um, some of them took, had great pride in their current schools. Um, some of them would rather have their children taught by black teachers in black schools rather than white uh, 
white teachers in white schools. Um, so there are lots of reasons. Uh, but then the court basically said freedom of choice is in itself not enough. We have to have racial balance. Um, and I think, you know, if, if I'd been on the court at the time, I would have had a fair amount of sympathy for that position because so often freedom of choice was a fraud or based on intimidation. Um, but then a, as a result, the idea of the racial balance in itself became the end of desegregation. Um, and then that was transferred to the North where um, the segregation, um, the, the separation of race was based on residence usually. Um, and then when you were turned north, I'd say that the, the focus became not segregation per se, but what the Civil Rights Commission called racial isolation. Racial isolation regardless of cause. Um, and the idea was that if you had the right mix of black and white students, basically 70% white, 30% black, then black students' uh, education would be greatly expanded, greatly improved. Um, so in that transition, social science became crucial. And um, often the social sciences presented in the courts was, was pretty weak. I assume that that social science was finding beneficial effects of racial balancing, which on further uh, examination didn't, didn't hold up to scrutiny. That's right. Uh, kind of extravagant claims about the advantages of uh, of a 70-30 mix. I mean, I, I, I come back to that because the argument was that you wanted the white kids to set the culture of the school and then the black kids would take advantage of that because that, the white kids would be high SES, black kids would be low SES, um, and you wanted to have the culture set by the high SES students. So there, you know, I just said the way you then said, said well, uh, black students in Rock, uh, Roxbury will benefit by going to South Boston High School. Um, that really didn't, didn't fit the, the theory. <laughs> <laughs> be, because they met with hostility at South Boston High School? Because South Boston High School wasn't that much better than Dorchester High School or Roxbury High School. Yes, exactly. I, I wouldn't say that the kind of learning culture in South Boston High School um, was much different from, uh, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it were worse than Roxbury High School. Um, uh, so I really wasn't, uh, the idea that racial, I, I would put it this way, that there were these theor uh, theories that were presented from social science that often bore very little resemblance to the facts on the ground in many of these cities. Gary Orfield, that was a name I was trying to think of uh, just a moment ago in this conversation. Uh, I think he's a political scientist who was at the Harvard Education and went out to UCLA and right. had a big center that was getting the numbers on precisely these kind of isolation trends. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I'll just say a word about Gary Orfield, whose first book on desegregation, Reconstruction of Southern Education, was a terrific book. Um, his recent claims about resegregation, re though, I think are highly suspect. Um, and I just quickly say there are two ways of measuring resegregation. One is evenness. To what extent are black, white, Asian, Hispanic students spread evenly across the schools within the district? And there hasn't been too much change in that. Now, we're fairly high on evenness with, within school districts. We do fairly well. It, the other is exposure. How, how many white students are in school with black students as one way? How many white students are exposed to non-white students? Um, and there has been a decline in exposure, um, but it's almost entirely due to the fact that there aren't nearly as many white students in public schools anymore. Um, and many of them are in areas um, that there are very few, few minority students. So if you look at, if you ask the question differently of um, are black students exposed to um, students of different ethnicities and races, either Latino students or Asian students, the exposure actually has gone up. Uh, if you ask, are, are white students exposed to more minority students? The answer is yes, they are exposed to more minority students. So which statistics you use um, are crucial 
Um, and I'm afraid that Gary Orfield always used it's a relatively misleading statistic. So, okay. It's one thing to bar a kid from a school because of the kid's race. It's another thing for parents to have feelings about the race of the students that their kids are going to school with and to act on those feelings by electing private education, by moving to another district or even another region of the country because they have feelings about... What is the court's... uh, uh, view of the relevance to constitutional considerations of those two different uh, concerns. One about don't act in such a way as to discriminate with racial intent, but the other about do I actually have to correct the consequences of people acting on their own preferences uh, because I don't like the outcome when they act on their own preferences? Mm-hmm. Is, is that a clear distinction? Well, what I would say is... It- you asked the question, how did the court respond to those two different understandings? I yes. said, with many decades of avoidance and ambiguity. <laughs> if I could say one thing about the Supreme Court's decision on desegregation was the extent of ambiguity and their willingness or eagerness to avoid the hardest questions. And that is the hardest question. Um, so you, the, the court goes back and forth on these. Um, And within the court, you can see major differences of opinion and being, uh, in the majority opinion, being kind of covered over with ambiguous language, leaving the lower courts in an enormously difficult situation. Um, And the big one way in which this came about is that because the court has made it very clear that if there's any evidence that there's been legal uh, segregation in a school district in any form, um, then you have to have equally, evenly balanced schools across the district. But then the court in the key decision in Detroit said that you can't draw in kids from the white sur- suburbs to uh, desegregate the inner city because if people want to lo- move to the suburbs, that's their choice, and it wasn't the state or the school district that did the uh, did the segregating. So that really shows that they want to have a little bit of it, they want to have it both ways. That case was called Milliken versus Bradley, as I recall. Correct, 1974. I actually cited it in my 1976 PhD thesis <laughs> at MIT because I was trying to make the point that uh, if opportunity is partly determined by the decisions about a so- social connection that people are free to make, mm-hmm then the idea, uh, and I really kind of was influenced by uh, James Fishkin. Do you remember this book, Equal Opportunity and the Family, Justice, Equal Opportunity and the Family, something like that? Anyway. Well, anyway, anyway, the, the argument is if, if people are free to make choices about their own association and if a consequence of those choices to generate opportunity or the lack thereof for those whom they choose not to associate with, then you've got a real problem. If you want equality of opportunity, but you also want liberty, you, you want people to be free to move, to access, to live their lives without government constraint, well, you're up against the hard, you know, a hard problem there. I, and I, I put it, uh, in education, it's even more of a, of, uh, a tension because on one hand, we, we expect education to provide equal, edu- equal opportunity. You know, that's what we believe in the United States. It's education that's going to it's the key. Yeah. rise up. And in Brown, Chief Justice um, Warren said that the Equal Protection Clause requires equal educational opportunity. But we also have an incredibly decentralized education system um, so that people can move around to different school districts. And those school districts will have different financing. They'll have different policies. They'll have different sorts of teachers. Um, and I'll just go... Uh, that problem is particularly true, it turns out, in the, in the Northeast, in Midwest, where you have these very tiny school districts. In the South, you had huge school districts. So you can include mm-hmm. the suburbs and the inner cities. Austin, tiny. Um, most most uh, northern cities, really tiny school districts. So if you're going to try to have suburban, urban desegregation, you have to cross district lines, and the court said you can't do that. I think they had good reason for saying that. Uh, 
but it vastly complicated the problem of reaching the goal that they had established for themselves. Uh, you're the Thomas P. O'Neill Jr. Professor, Tip O'Neill, former, the late Tip O'Neill, uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives for many, many years, iconic Boston Irish politician. And I remember, because I was in graduate school in, in Cambridge uh, in the early mid-70s, you know, the intensity of, of, the, of the reaction uh, to that. Um, are we ever likely to see something like that again? I mean, uh, that reaction, blowback, resistance from not, 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 you know, dug in kind of racist resistance, but just I don't want my kid bust across town kind of resistance. You know, I, you know, it's not my problem. Why are you putting that on me? You're disrupting my life. You're forcing me. You're recruiting me into a crusade I didn't sign up for resistance. Mm -hmm. Um, what, where was Tip O'Neill in that mix, by the way? Um, Tip was where a lot of Massachusetts Democrats were, which was trying to straddle the issue. Mm. Um, uh, same with Kevin White and many others. Um, I think he probably leaned in the direction of uh, uh, the desegregation order. Um, but uh, to an extent possible, tried not to be uh, directly identified with it. You know, um, the Kennedy, uh, Ted Kennedy, um, was caught in that uh, maelstrom too, uh, and all of the Boston politicians. Uh, on the question of will we see that again, in some ways, in a small way, we're seeing it all the time. Um, because um, over the last about uh, 20 years, there's been effort to uh, release schools from these uh, uh, injunctions and court orders. Um, and sometimes it has been white parents, as in Charlotte, um, has said, no, we have, the bus rides have gotten longer and longer and longer. We um, need to end this. Um, and the court did end it, and they, but as part of a deal, they said, we're going to put a lot more resources into the schools in downtown uh, Charlotte. And actually, they did see an increase in uh, the uh, NAEP tests in Charlotte um, as a result of you had fewer white, fewer white students, but you had more resources. That wasn't uniformly true. Turns out in some of the junior high schools, um, the guys, in, as the schools got less integrated, um, both the black and the white guys started to get into more trouble with criminal justice. So there are kind of conflicting signals. But in other places, it was the black parents that said, we're sick of having our kids bus long distances. Um, and it was the black students, uh, and black parents who wanted the, the court orders lifted. So in smaller, less dramatic ways, I think we're seeing that still. You know, I was struck when you said earlier that uh, some of the difficulty in achieving integration in the South came from the fact that black uh, communities resisted having their institutions dismantled or the kids, you know, going to school in majority white settings. And um, I recall some of the uh, arguments that Justice Thomas would make in some of these uh, opinions, dissents and concurrences in which he would extol the uh, effectiveness of some mm -hmm. black schools that were not desegregated, but that were nevertheless really, really quite outstanding drawing on the work of Thomas Sowell, who chronicled some of these, some of these schools. Um, is there any political support, any, you know, uh, local NAACP or Urban League branch, uh, state rep um, or municipal official African-American prepared to stand apart a little bit from the Democratic Party's uh, general narrative about, uh, you know, anti-discrimination and whatnot and assert the, um, I, I don't, I wonder whether it exists there and hasn't been reported or whether it, it really isn't a, a significant factor in the politics of, of this question. My sense is that um, the, the kind of, um, dissent from the national uh, civil rights organizations positions has tend to focus much more on charter schools and choice and vouchers. Choice. 
then yeah. on, on the, uh, in the history of desegregation, of course, there have been were some mighty battles between local groups and the uh, national NAACP, especially in Atlanta, um, and uh, but also in Detroit, where um, the, the local black leader said, "Hey, finally, we've got control over our schools. We're electing the school committee. We're electing the mayors." Um, we don't want to share our control over the schools with these white suburban school districts and superintendents. Um, in Atlanta, the Atlanta Compromise uh, basically said, we will, um, we're not going to try to have a racial balance, but we will have racial control over our schools. Um, and Detroit, the same thing basically happened eventually. Um, but I believe the, the black mayor, I think it was Coleman Young at the time, basically said, we want decentralization, not, not um, urban suburban buster. Okay. Can we talk about Title IX? Sure. <laughs> I'm always happy to talk about <laughs> Title IX. Okay, again, here's my layman's uh, untutored take, which is it used to be that a girl could go to college and she could be a soccer player or a tennis player or whatever. And the program that she was uh, able to avail herself of was much underfunded and, and less uh, effective and expansive and whatnot. And so her ability to realize her athletic ambition in college was not as great as a guy because the football team got this, and the basketball team got that. And maybe even at the intramural level, there was racial discrimination in the availability of athletics. And so you needed a fix and you got one in Title IX. But then it somehow became a date rape remedy and uh, local uh, colleges having to administer regulations about sexual assault, things that became, took on a whole life of its own. And that's not what was intended when the initial regulation was formulated. And there's a story to tell about how it got from the one to the other. Right. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> pretty much right. Yeah. I mean, that's story. <laughs> I take uh, about 300 pages to tell the story, but uh, that's, that's a pretty good summary. I will add a couple elements. First, when Title IX was passed in 1972, there wasn't even much emphasis on sports um, because there were more serious issues. More, um that a lot of schools had admissions rules of, that prohibited um, women from applying. Um, and there was a lot of employment discrimination. So the people who wrote the law were particularly concerned uh, with admissions above all, especially to grad schools. Um, and uh, the really uh, quite rampant discrimination against women in employment. I'll just give one example with the institution we're familiar with. Um, in the Harvard government department, um, when Title IX was passed in 1972, I believe there was only one tenured member of the faculty that was uh, Dita Schlar. Um, and for a long time, she was just an instructor, not a professor. She's a brilliant political theorist, as I recall. Yeah, and uh, she was kind of a second-class citizen in the department for some time. So those are the, it was the emphasis was on education and very serious forms of discrimination. Um, those problems um, were dealt with relatively quickly. And of course, we all know that now women are outpacing men in every aspect of education, K through 12, grad school, PhD programs. Um, I see it in my classroom. Um, they're doing better in guys and guys really need to step it up. Um, but... Then we, so the focus turned to sports. You might say, why? And the reason was because that's the only part of the educational process um, of significance that is segregated by sex. Um, so we said, we're going to have separate but equal in college athletics. And then the question became, what's, what's equal? Um, and that was complicated because you have football. So you can't do an equal spending. Hard to say that um, you, know, you, can't, you can't say, well, um, one football team is equal to one field hockey team because football, as one person said, uh, is the fat man that's tipping the sports canoe. Um, so that we struggled with that. Um, the, I could say more about what I think some mistakes we made with athletics, but then I'd say that we went from the classroom to the playing field and then in the 1990s and after we went to, let's say, to the bedroom with sexual harassment, 
um, and to the bathroom with transgender rights. So um, all of these issues that we didn't even have the language to talk about in 1972 um, have become uh, central because the language of Title IX is very vague. Um, Congress has not seen fit to intervene. Um, and especially under Democratic administrations, you have a lot of responsiveness to, uh, to interest groups that are pushing a new agenda. I'm assuming this is mostly driven by administrative discretion and not by court edict. Well, at that time, I wouldn't, I think that's not true. Um, I would say that it is equally a function of both. I call this uh, leapfrogging in my book, where the agency would take a small move and the court will confirm it and go a little further than the agency will beyond that. So it, it, um, in sports, the, the key decision was a first circuit decision um, called um, Cohen versus Brown, Brown University, um, um, where the president of Brown uh, fought tooth and nail about this against his understanding of you had to have more spending for women's sports. And he lost in the second sec in the first circuit. And that was the key decision um, on sports. I see. So on the transgender question, what is Title IX's relevance to that, and, and how is it playing out? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a complicated story. That um, it, it has basically come down to uh, the question. Yes, it, Title IX says you can't discriminate if you are receiving federal funds on the basis of sex. Um, what is the relationship between sex and gender? Um, the courts, and to some extent, of civil rights has said, when they said sex, they meant gender. But of course, the term gender was basically given new meaning to distinguish it from sex. Um, so if you're looking for a logical progression of thought, you won't find it in these decisions. Um, I guess what I would say was the key um, linchpin of these um, expansion of transgender rights is the idea that um, Title IX was created to undo sex stereotypes. And a sex stereotype is um, assuming that a transgender person should fit our mold of male or female. So if you, if you discriminate on the basis of transgender status, you're discriminating on the basis of an illegal sex stereotype. You know, if that seems a little odd, it's very odd. Has this been vetted at the Supreme Court? It has not come to the Supreme Court. Um, I would just point out the Supreme Court has never issued a decision on sports and um, Title IX. It's all lower court. The lower courts have generally been quite supportive of a broad reading of Title IX to protect transgender students. I think if this comes to the Supreme Court, the outcome will be quite different. Um, and uh, I'll just say, you know, parenthetically, the Supreme Court has dealt with the issue of discrimination against transgender people in employment, the Bostock decision. Um, and I actually, the, the Supreme Court said that discrimination against uh, transgender people in employment is prohibited by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. I actually, I think that's a completely reasonable decision. Because under Title VII, basically said, you know, can you do this job? And if you wear a dress or don't wear a dress, wear makeup, or you don't wear makeup, you know, um, that, that's, you know, that doesn't determine how well you can do the job. Um, the issue in Title IX tends to be different because it involves where do you put people when you have sex segregation that is legal? And that's a yeah, different Yeah, like bathrooms. Bathrooms, locker rooms, and above all, locker rooms, prisons. prisons. But that's not a higher education thing, right? But uh, so when 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 you have sex segregation that is that is uh, legal and appropriate, then the transgender issue becomes a lot more complicated. Okay, now here's an argument that I'm not actually making <laughs> because it's absolutely unacceptable, but I can hear it being made by some of the people I grew up with back on the south side of Chicago. And it's to a certain degree uh, inspired, although my uncle doesn't know that, by John David Scritney's book, The Minority Rights Revolution. I know you know the book, yeah, and right. I know you know the guy. 
Uh, he's a sociologist, political sociologist at uh, UCSD. And the argument is, how do I know it's a civil rights question? Answer, if I can make an, a credible analogy to the situation of Blacks about whatever the group is, it's got a pretty good chance of clearing the hurdle to be a civil rights issue. Right. So here's the argument that you can't make. I'm Black. You're appropriating the suffering of my ancestors and the unique characteristic of my struggle for equal citizenship in this country on behalf of postmodern, hypermodern, unchristian. I'm sorry, I'm just making the argument my uncle's going to make, <laughs> you know, uh, stuff like transgender stuff. And I object. I have a fair amount of sympathy for that position. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not actually taking, but I can imagine my uncle taking it. No, no, no. I got some sympathy for it, too. I'll confess yeah. that. You do. Uh, you do. Of course, uh, with Peter Scarry on diversity issues. And one thing Peter and I tend to be agree with is that the, the position of African Americans in this country is unique. And unique means only one. Now, there are other forms of discrimination. But I, I guess what I would say, and here I agree with John Scranton, that one of the way in which public policy was made was basically to say, um, we are, we should get the same protections as African Americans. Um, and therefore, we, all, of, all of the remedies should be the same. But the remedies shouldn't necessarily be the same because the situations are different. And I'll give you this is my next book, basically, um, that um, racial discrimination and sex discrimination are different. That's why we allow separate but equal for sports for one, but not for the other. Racial harassment is based on um, prejudice and hatred and all kinds of ugly other ugly things. Sexual harassment against women might be the result of that, but it might also be the result of attraction um, and uh, desire for, for intimacy that is unwanted by the woman in question. So those are different situations. Uh, the same thing happened with on the basis of disability. Um, the, the laws um, initially, with especially Section 504, say you can't discriminate. But discrimination meant that you have to take into account our particular situations and mold what we are accommodations to our particular situation, not acting like, you know, not treating us equally and the same regardless of race. So in all of these ways in which we have used the language of discrimination, we have overlooked key differences among the nature of the problem. And that's where I think um, the, the piggybacking on the, uh, the laws that were passed to aid African-Americans um, produce some uh, undesirable consequences. What do you make of uh, the CRT debate? Uh, Ron DeSantis is running for president in part on the Florida's where woke comes to die campaign. Uh, is there a credible kind of pushback that could find, uh, you know, respectable position in, in political pol in, in our politics that we're People are saying, no, you can't take down Abraham Lincoln's statue or, or no, uh, I don't want the 1619 Project curriculum foisted on my kids or, or whatever. How would you contrast what seems to me to be a nascent kind of reactionary, and I don't mean that pejoratively, I just mean it literally, development where people are pushing back against CRT to the resistance to force busing uh, from 30, 40 years ago or... 50 years ago? Well, I mean, I, it, clearly there is a problem with various forms of critical race theory being taught as dogma. Um, and, but I fear that a lot of the people who are doing this, especially, you know, whether it be in college or high school, um, don't really know what they're doing. Um, so if you're doing what? The, they don't really know much about critical race theory. Oh, who are resisting critical race theory. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. So in some ways, I find it's just kind of uh, the shadow boxing in which some of the key issues are being um, badly distorted. I teach a course um, which I teach critical race theory. And then I teach people who are critical of critical race theory, um, which works great at the 
at the college level. I mean, I, my guess is my, my students, I think after they read some of the key uh, articles on critical race theory, said, this doesn't make much sense. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, this is Derek yeah. Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw? Or, yeah. You know, I mean, there yeah. are some kernels of truth, uh, of uh, importance there, but they take them so far. So the idea that you would try to ban critical race theory, at least at the college level, I find just the wrong um, strategy. Um, and, but in general, I'd say at all levels that rather than saying you can't teach this, you got to say, well, how can we show what the debate is presenting competing points of view? Now, um, I, I had the same thing. I had students read the 1619 project and the historian's critique of it. And there's no doubt that the students thought the critiques were pretty damning. Um, so how you deal with this at the, at the elementary school level, I'm not sure. Um, but I do think that, as usual, kind of the Trump wing of the Demo Republican Party and the, uh, uh, the extreme progressive wing of the Democratic Party feed on each other and make the whole situation worse. I'm, I'm thinking of an analogy. Suppose someone came in and said, we want to teach Karl Marx. Uh, and you know, I'm an economist. So, you know, I'm thinking, OK, Marx, he's not uninteresting, but he's also not right. Yeah. You know, the labor theory of value doesn't actually explain a whole lot. Which are the bet which is the better response? To ban the teaching of Marx or to allow Marx to be in the discussion and then to offer up the arguments about why it is we shouldn't take his predictions about modern economics uh, all that seriously. And obviously the latter, if you're a college teacher, is the way you ought to go. I think I, I'd say that, you know, part of the reason this discussion is gets so confused is that it's quite unclear versus what is critical race theory. You know, and it becomes watered down and kind of, uh, and so many of the things, if you take, um, uh, uh, what's your name? Uh, uh, Miss White Fragility. Um, uh, Angela, oh, no, uh, yeah. God, I've forgotten well, it too. I've got it on the shelf over. But, you know, does she present a clear view of what critical race theory is? No. Um, um, and uh, if you trace it, it's interesting intellectually to trace back what the key tenets are and to critique them. But usually that's not what is being taught in, in college or in high school or any place else. And I think what I said before is for most Robin people... Robin D'Angelo, sorry. Robin yeah, D'Angelo. Um, that most of the people who are um, presenting that point of view don't know anything about the theoretical basis of it. Um, okay, why don't we name names? I think of James Lindsay. Uh, I think of Christopher Rufo, who's got a new book out. He's my colleague at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, may he live long and prosper, but that doesn't make him right about everything. Right. And they invoke uh, some uh, postmodern uh, uh, European continental uh, philosophy and uh, they, they throw in a little Marx and, and uh, a little Foucault and, and, and whatnot and, and uh, say, ah. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I've spent a little too more time than I would like to in some of these readings. Um, and, but I would say, uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's related, that um, there, are, it, there are the Claremont conservatives um, blame everything on progressivism and on Hegel. Um, I've actually disagreed fairly strenuously with the Claremontsters on these items. I think I've been um, banned from the Claremont Review of Books for that. But there, there, uh, one view is that it was really bad political theory that, that is responsible for many of the aspects of modern life that they disagree with. I think an easier explanation came from Tocqueville, which is these are some of the, the features of democratic progression. And um, I think that's a more convincing argument. Um, and um, Can you spell that out a little bit? I'm not sure I see what you mean. That, that, that Tocqueville argued that inherent in democracy is a demand for greater and greater equality. Uh, um, and as society gets more equal, the remaining forms of inequality become more grating. Um, 
And there's also a tendency in democracy for government to grow larger over time. He has a very convincing argument why this is. Um, so if you simply took, took those arguments about the demand for equality, the growing power of the government, what he called uh, the democratic uh, 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 the administrative despotism, um, that you can see many of the features of American political life that I think uh, some conservatives have uh, a tribute to Hegel and to uh, the invasion of uh, European thought into American liberalism. And I think that they put too much emphasis upon those um, abstract theories, which is not surprising because most of these people are theorists, um, and uh, that there are simpler explanations, and I think generally simpler explanations tend to be more convincing. Okay, more of a homegrown phenomenon than than a, a import, right? And, and again, the other thing I'd add is that the Tocqueville pointed out that many of the features of American democracy that we prize, the extent of um, multiple associations, social capital, um, local government, all of those things that he thought were the crucial parts of American politics, he was very afraid they were going to fade over time. Um, because they really were running up against some of the central themes and demands of, of democracy. And I think that we've seen that over time. So you can see, though, it's not just, just uh, that uh, he deals, Togel argues, some of the things I see in America are American, some of them are democratic, and they're not always uh, equally aligned with each other. Have you got a title for the new book, or the next book? Uh, the next book's going to be called Building the Civil Rights State. And it will deal more with more of these issues of how the race analogy was applied in inappropriate ways. I look forward to it. Okay, Shep. Well, it's been good talking to you. Thanks a lot for your time and for the enlightenment. And I'm glad that I, I passed the test. I, I got a couple of papers in uh, with the thesis that you give your approval to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I, I have learned a lot from you over time, so maybe oh. I'm... Maybe I've integrated some of your thinking into my writing. Okay. Well, see you at 1737 Cambridge uh, next time. Good. Thank you very much for having me on. Been my pleasure. Take care. Mm -hmm.